Batman Begins Written by Benjamin Harper Based on a screenplay by Christopher Nolan and David S. Sawyer Young Bruce Wayne and his friend Rachel Dawes were playing on the Wayne estate when Bruce fell into an abandoned well. He spiraled down into the darkness and landed hard. Something rustled in the gloom. As it scuttled closer, Bruce trembled in fear. Hundreds of angry bats swirled around Bruce as they swooped up the shaft of the well. Bruce thrashed his arms and screamed, but he could not escape the swarming bats. Years later, Bruce woke up in a nightmare of another kind. A jail cell, deep in the heart of Asia. He had spent his youth searching the planet to find a solution to his sadness, and had wound up trapped in a violent prison. At breakfast, several prisoners attacked Bruce, but he defeated them all. The guards threw him into solitary confinement for protection. Not for Bruce's safety, but to protect the other inmates. In the dark cell, Bruce was surprised that he was not alone. I thought this was supposed to be solitary confinement. My name is Ducard, but I speak on behalf of Ra's al Ghul. Ra's al Ghul and his League of Shadows offer a path to those who can uphold our code. Code? This world is run by tyrants. Our code respects only the natural order of things. There is a rare poppy that grows on the eastern slopes. Tomorrow, you will be released. Pick one of the flowers. If you can carry it to the monastery on the top of the mountain, there you may find what you're looking for. What am I looking for? Purpose. Bruce pushed his way through the driving snow up an icy ridge, until he finally reached an ancient monastery perched atop a rocky outcropping. He staggered to the vast doors and pounded on them with all of his remaining strength. There was no answer. Frantic, Bruce pounded and pounded until he finally heard the doors grinding open. He stumbled into a massive hall. Bruce's hand trembled as he held up the blue poppy he'd found. At the far end, the dark, robed figure of Ra's al Ghul waited, seated on a throne. Bruce approached but was immediately surrounded by an army of ninja. They were armed and ready to attack. However, Ducard interrupted. Wait. He was leaning against a pillar nearby. Ra's al Ghul spoke to Bruce, and Ducard translated. We will help you conquer your fear. In exchange, you will renounce the cities of man. You will live in solitude. You will be a member of the League of Shadows, and you will be without fear. Bruce's training in the League of Shadows began immediately, and even though Bruce was exhausted, Ducard lunged at him. Death does not wait for you to be ready. Death is not considerate or fair. Bruce snapped out of his fatigue and fought back. He used his previous training in jiu-jitsu to fend off his attacker. Ducard sensed that something was wrong with Bruce. You're afraid. Not of me. Tell us, Wayne. What do you fear? Bruce remembered a recurring nightmare he'd had when he was young. Bats attacking him. He flashed back to a night in his childhood when he woke up screaming. His father rushed into his bedroom. Bruce. The bats again? Bruce nodded. Bruce's father was the most important man in Gotham City, owner of Wayne Industries, 
but he still had time to be loving and devoted to his son. You know why they attacked? They were afraid of you. Afraid of me? You're a lot bigger than a bat, aren't you? All creatures feel fear, even the scary ones. Then Bruce was flooded with the memory of the night he and his parents left an opera performance early, because a scene with bats had filled him with terror. After exiting into an alley behind the theater, the Waynes were stopped by a man holding a gun. Wallet. Jewelry. Fast. Bruce's parents were obeying the man when the gun went off. Twice. <laughs> Suddenly an orphan, Bruce was left in the care of Alfred, the family butler. Bruce couldn't help blaming himself for his parents' death. It's my fault. I made them leave the theater. No, no, Master Bruce. Nothing you did. Nothing anyone ever did can excuse that pain. Back in the Himalayan monastery, Ducard asked, Do you still feel responsible? My anger outweighs my guilt. Over the next few weeks, Bruce stayed at the monastery and was trained in the ancient art of ninjutsu. He and Ducard practiced their sword techniques, and Ducard gave him lessons in how to defeat his enemies, using any means possible. Theatricality and deception are powerful agents. To be a great warrior is not enough. Flesh and blood, however skilled, can be destroyed. You must be more than a man in the eyes of your opponents. To prove his point, Ducard tossed a pinch of explosive powder, creating a brilliant burst of blinding fire. You're ready, Bruce. Ducard then put on a ninja mask. Why the masks? To conquer fear, you must become fear. All the ninjas stepped toward Bruce, the nearest one slashing at him with his sword. Bruce dashed through the group, fighting for his life as each ninja continued the assault. One by one, Bruce fought off the ninja attackers, until at last he had defeated Ducard. We have purged you of your fear. You are ready to lead these men. As Gotham's favored son, you will be ideally placed to help us destroy the city. The horror of what Ducard said sank in. Bruce couldn't destroy Gotham City. It was his home. He would fight to protect it. Bruce smashed a candle to the ground, setting the monastery on fire. What are you doing? What's necessary? Bruce swiftly knocked Ducard unconscious with the hilt of his sword. Ra's al Ghul leapt off his throne, attacking Bruce with stunningly quick blows. As the monastery burned, Bruce battled furiously with the leader of the League of Shadows. Just when Bruce felt he might be losing the fight, a burning chunk of the ceiling fell, and crushed Ra's al Ghul. Bruce grabbed Ducard and dragged him safely to a small mountain village. Then Bruce left the mountain and went home to Gotham City. Gotham was overrun by crime and violence. Bruce had to do something to stop the decay. He needed a plan. He was walking the grounds of Wayne Manor when he came to the well he had fallen into as a child. Bruce lowered himself down the well shaft and found a crumbling crevice at the bottom. As Bruce pushed the rocks aside, air rushed into his face. He turned on a lamp he had brought. He had discovered an immense cavern. Looking up, Bruce saw the ceiling move. It was alive. Thousands of bats swooped down, and swarmed him in a cyclone. Bruce needed a fearsome symbol to use in his fight to bring Gotham to its former glory. 
As he stood among the bats, he was suddenly certain what that symbol would be. Bruce knew that a crime lord named Carmine Falcone ran Gotham City and controlled a mast of the public officials. With him calling the shots, Gotham could never be cleaned up, and very few people were brave enough to fight Falcone and his henchmen. One of those brave people was Bruce's childhood friend Rachel Dawes, who had become an assistant district attorney. Another person who was standing up to Falcone was Sergeant Jim Gordon, one of the few trustworthy members of the police force. Bruce knew what his first job as Batman had to be, to bring down Falcone. Bruce drove through the decaying streets of Gotham, on his way to Wayne Industries. He had decided to work at his family's company, in the Applied Sciences Division. This division created all sorts of experimental equipment for military use. Bruce wanted to get his hands on those top secret devices. In the Applied Sciences office, Bruce met Lucius Fox, who was in charge of the division. Full of loyalty to the Wayne family, Lucius agreed to share all sorts of devices with Bruce. Lucius first showed Bruce a near bulletproof tear resistant outfit. Here it is, the Nomex survival suit for advanced infantry. This sucker will stop a knife. Batman was ready to make his first move. He slunk across the rooftops of Gotham City. Using ninja claws attached to his hands and feet, he scaled the wall of the police station until he entered Sergeant Gordon's office. Gordon, busy working at his desk, didn't notice Batman until the lights went out. What do you want? You're a good cop. One of the few. What would it take to stop Falcone? Gordon explained that it would be very difficult to stop the crime lord, since he influenced everything in Gotham. Who are you? Watch for a sign. Then, Batman vanished out the window. Gordon ran to the window and saw Batman racing toward a gap between two office buildings. When Batman reached it, he dropped to a building below, then melted into the shadows. Back at Wayne Industries, Lucius showed Bruce more secret weapons, including a magnetic grappling hook that could hold up to 350 pounds, and a very impressive item called memory fabric. If the fabric was curved in a certain shape and an electrical current was run through it, the fabric would stay in place. Bruce could make lightweight wings. Then, Lucius showed Bruce the lab's most important creation, the tumbler, a massive armored car. As Bruce and Lucius zoomed in the tumbler over a test track, Lucius explained its finer points. The tumbler could jump without using a ramp. Bruce only had one question. Does it come in black? In the Batcave, Alfred helped Bruce perfect his Batsuit. To test Batman's mask, Alfred smashed it with a baseball bat. The mask cracked in two. A bold landing on your head. Instead of replying, Bruce concentrated on grinding a piece of metal into a bat shape. Why the design, Master White? A man, however strong, is just flesh and blood. I need to become more than a man. I need to become a symbol. Why a bat? Bats frighten me, Alfred. It's time my enemies share my dread. Bruce hurled his finished batarang, and it whistled into the cavern's darkness. Down at the docks, several thugs unloaded boxes. Detective Flass, Carmine Falcone, 
and Dr. Jonathan Crane, the administrator at Arkham Asylum, inspected the contents. The boxes contain stuffed animals, filled with a mysterious substance. You know who we're working for, Falcone. And when he sees what's been going on, he won't be happy. He's... he's coming to Gotham. Yeah, soon. One thug near the loading dock called to his partner. But there was no reply. He went to search for him, only to discover a giant bat hanging from a crane. The bat extended his huge wings and swooped toward the thug. The thug screamed as he was knocked off his feet, and blackness enveloped him. The rest of Falcone's henchmen heard the scream and ran toward the loading area. There, they too met the black shape hovering above the docks. Falcone, anxious to find out exactly what was going on with his men, hurried into the loading area to investigate. He rounded a corner and discovered his henchmen in a circle, frightened and confused. In the center of their circle, dropped a black shadow, that confronted the thugs, kicking them and ducking their attacks with precision. The thugs either got knocked out or ran away. Confused, Falcone shouted to the mysterious individual. What are you? I'm Batman. Gordon and the police arrived at the docks, after all of the action was over. They found the shipment of the mysterious substance smashed up and surrounded by unconscious criminals. One cop approached Gordon. Cody's men? Does it matter? We'll never tie it to him anyway. I wouldn't be too sure of that. The cop pointed upward. Gordon looked up. Against the night clouds, the symbol of a bat shone from a searchlight. As Gordon approached the searchlight, he saw Falcone strapped to the light, arms outstretched, creating the bat's shape. Rachel Dawes beamed, tossing a newspaper onto the district attorney's desk. The front page had a huge picture of Falcone, strapped to the searchlight. There's no way to bury it now, even if his partners swear in court to being trashed by a giant bat. We have Falcone at the scene. Rachel was thrilled that she would be able to use her job as assistant district attorney to help Gotham battle its worst crime lord. Maybe things were finally turning around for the city. Dr. Crane was buzzed through the thick steel doors of the prison. He asked a prison guard for permission to see their newest prisoner, Carmine Falcone. He was greeted by a prison guard. He's probably looking for the insanity plan. The guard led Crane to a holding room, where Falcone was waiting. We got a lot to talk about. How are you gonna convince me to keep my mouth shut? I know you wouldn't want the cops taking a closer look at the powder they seized. And I know about your experiments on the inmates at your nut house. So, what was that powder I was bringing in for you, Crane? If he wanted you to know, he'd have told you himself. Crane reached into his briefcase and pulled out a hideous burlap sack, slipping it over his head. Would you like to see my mask, Falcone? I use it in my experiments. Probably not frightening to a guy like you, but those crazies? A cloud of white smoke billowed out of Crane's briefcase. They scream and they cry. Crane continued through the air filter in his mask. As Falcone gazed at Crane, the smoke took effect. Lizard tongues flicked out of the mask. Flames spurted out of Crane's eyes and mouth. Falcone screamed in absolute horror, losing his mind. A few minutes later, Crane emerged from the room, 
smiling in satisfaction. Oh, he's not faking insanity. I'll see if I can get the judge to move him to a secure wing at Arkham Asylum. Meanwhile, Richard Earle, the head of Wayne Industries, got a report about some trouble. Rogers, a senior executive, explained that one of the company's cargo ships had been found heavily damaged, and a prototype weapon had been stolen from its hold. Earl covered his face with his hands. That was very bad news. The weapon, a microwave emitter, was designed for desert warfare. It used focused microwaves to vaporize an enemy's water supply. Rogers continued with the bad news. It looks like someone fired it up at sea, judging by the damage to the ship. What about the weapon? It's, um, missing. Detective Flass walked down the street. He was caught and pulled up between buildings until he was face to face with Batman. Who was with Falcone at the docks? I never knew his name. Never. There was something in the powder. Something hidden. I never went to the drop off. It's in the Narrows. Cops can go to the Narrows except in force. Gotham's masked defender clenched his fists. Batman can. The Narrows, an island in the middle of Gotham River, was a puzzle of public housing and makeshift buildings, circling Arkham, as Batman landed on the Narrows, and slipped into a warehouse. He spied the huge industrial machine that had been stolen from the ship. Standing around it were Dr. Crane and several dock workers. Batman approached Crane and his workers, and Crane sprayed the deadly smoke in Batman's face. Batman dodged most of the poison but inhaled a little, causing him to have horrible visions. Need a light? Crane threw gasoline and a match on Batman, who toppled out of the window. On fire and fighting illusions, Batman tumbled to the ground. He landed with a thud. The street was wet from rain, and the flames sizzled out. Batman spoke into a cell phone. Alfred, come quickly. I've been poisoned. We need a blood set. Bruce took a sample of his blood to Lucius Fox, so Lucius could concoct an antidote to the poison. He also asked Lucius to find out what the machine was that he had seen at Arkham Asylum. I'll make a couple calls. Bruce headed over to the district attorney's office. There he found Rachel and Sergeant Gordon discussing the case against Falcone. Rachel, I wanted to invite you to my birthday party tonight. Before Rachel could respond, an assistant ran into her office and broke the news. Rachel, Falcone has been moved to Arkham Asylum. He's gone crazy. Guess I won't make it to your party. You're not going to Arkham now. It's in the Narrows, Rachel. Happy birthday, Bruce. With that, Rachel raced out of her office. Bruce knew Rachel wouldn't be safe in the Narrows. He told Alfred to keep the guests occupied at his birthday party until he returned. Tell that joke you know. Bruce stepped over to his piano, struck four notes, and waited for his secret entrance to the Batcave to swing open. Down the hidden spiral staircase he wove until he reached a dumb waiter. Climbing in, he released the lift and plummeted down into the Batcave. When the dumb waiter hit bottom, Bruce climbed out of it and quickly transformed himself into Batman. Asylum, Rachel discussed Falcone's situation with Dr. Crane. She found it difficult to believe that Falcone had gone insane so quickly. 
When they reached Falcone's room, Rachel peered through the window. Falcone was strapped to the bed inside, repeating the word Scarecrow in a horrified voice. Scarecrow. Crane told her she was correct, as they continued deeper into the decrepit asylum. Rachel replied that she didn't trust his methods, and was bringing another psychiatrist out to Arkham to examine Falcone. Crane stopped short in a room filled with vials and bags of powder. This is where we make the medicine, Miss Dawes. Perhaps you should have some. As he turned around, Rachel ran in the other direction. Rachel tried frantically to escape the asylum, but none of the elevators were working, and she was lost. Boo! She turned to see a hideous burlap mask and a puff of gas. Rachel fell, coughing. She screamed when she saw that the eye holes in Crane's mask were shooting out flames. As Crane's henchman dragged her away, the lights in the asylum went out. He's here. The Batman. Call the police. You want the cops here? Force the Batman outside, and the police will take him down. What about the girl? She's gone. I gave her a concentrated dose. The mind can only take so much. Glass smashed out of a high window as a dark shape burst into the room. Batman quickly took down both of the thugs, leaving Crane hiding somewhere with his toxic gas. As Batman scrambled through the darkness, he could hear sirens outside. He had to act fast. He found Rachel cowering in fear from the awful hallucinations. Crane burst out from the shadows, attempting to blow a cloud of gas at Batman. Batman grabbed Crane and ripped off his protective mask. Taste your own medicine, doctor. Then Batman squeezed the mask, squirting a spray of the gas right into Crane's face. Who are you working for? Dr. Crane struggled, lost in horrific visions. Ra's al Ghul. Ra's al Ghul is dead, Crane. Who are you really working for? Ra's al Ghul. Ra's al Ghul is dead. I watched him die. Who are you working for? Dr. Crane isn't here right now. But if you'd like to make an appointment... Batman knew he wouldn't get any further information. He turned to Rachel, who was still writhing, battling dreadful images. Batman grabbed her and pinched a nerve, rendering her unconscious. The police forces were gathering outside. Batman had to get out of Arkham fast, if he was going to get the antidote to Rachel before it was too late. While working his way through the dark asylum, Batman ran into Sergeant Gordon. What happened to her? Green poisoned her with his toxin. I need to give her the antidote before the damage becomes permanent. Get her downstairs and maybe in the alley on the narrow side. How will you get out? I called for a backup. Green's been refining his toxin, stockpiling it. What was he planning? I don't know, but he's been working for someone else. Then Batman's backup arrived, summoned to the asylum by a sonic signal. All of the police dove for cover, as thousands of bats descended on them, swirling around their heads in a fevered whirlwind. With a great leap, Batman dropped down the stairwell, soaring into the depths of the asylum. Gordon dodged the bats, and carried Rachel down the steps to the alley. Take my car. I brought mine. Batman loaded Rachel into the Batmobile. With a loud roar, the awesome vehicle zoomed down the alley at top speed, until it disappeared in the darkness. I've got to get one of those. Inside the Batmobile, 
Batman tried to keep Rachel as calm as possible. She had regained consciousness and was struggling frantically, seeing horrible visions. It wasn't easy for Batman to concentrate on driving. A squadron of police cars was chasing him, along with a helicopter. The police tailed the Batmobile as it weaved in and out of traffic, trying in vain to lose them. Batman drove the Batmobile into a multi-level parking lot, racing up to the top floor, police hot on his trail. On the roof, Batman screeched to a halt. The police shouted from their vehicles. Turn off your engine. What are you doing? Trust me. Cannons shot out from the bottom of the Batmobile, blasting it over the far wall onto the roof of a nearby building. The police just stared as the Batmobile exploded from rooftop to rooftop, getting farther away from them. On the streets, the police tried to keep up with the Batmobile, which finally landed on the freeway, zooming from lane to lane, before tearing onto an exit ramp and cutting its lights on a service road. Batman drove with night vision until he approached a waterfall. Rachel screamed as they splashed right through the waterfall and landed in the Batcave. In the Batcave, Batman rushed Rachel to a table and gave her the antidote. He then handed her a syringe and two vials, telling her to get them both to Sergeant Gordon so they could mass-produce the antidote. Batman gave her a sedative, and promised that she would wake up soon in her own apartment. When she was sleeping, he instructed Alfred to take her home. Then, Batman changed back into his regular clothes, and went to join his birthday party upstairs, in Wayne Manor. Asylum, Gordon made a grim discovery. Crane had tapped into Gotham's water supply and had been tainting it with his dangerous powder for weeks. Gordon called a technician at the water board. If that's true, then it's already spread throughout the whole system. But no one's reported any effects. It must be like fluoride. Harmless to drink, but when you breathe it, it's deadly. See if there's a way to flush out the system. Gordon hung up and joined a group of other officers surrounding a strange device. What is it, Sarge? I don't know, but nobody gets near it. Understand? We're closing the bridges, locking down this whole island. At Bruce's party, the guests were getting ready to leave. He found Lucius and asked if he had discovered anything about the mysterious machine. It's a microwave emitter. It vaporizes water. Could you use it to put a biological agent into the air? Sure. If the water supply was poisoned before it was vaporized. Bruce was stunned. He knew what was going to happen. Then he felt a tap on his shoulder. Bruce, there's someone here you simply must meet. Right this way. Now am I pronouncing it right? Mr. Ra's Al Ghul? You're not Ra's al Ghul, he's dead. But is Ra's al Ghul immortal? Are his methods supernatural? Bruce spun around and came face to face with Ducard. Or cheap parlor tricks to conceal your true identity, Ra's. Ducard was actually Ra's al Ghul. I've been admiring your handiwork, even as it interfered with my plans. You were my greatest student until you betrayed me. Bruce spotted several members of the League of Shadows milling among the remaining guests, while Ra's al Ghul revealed that he had hired Crane to create the poison from a substance in the Blue Poppies. With Gotham City destroyed, the League of Shadows would be able to take over the world. When the last of the guests left, Ra's al Ghul's henchmen set fire to Wayne Manor. 
Ra's al Ghul asked Bruce to return to the League of Shadows, but Bruce refused. The two fought violently as Wayne Manor burned around them. Sword slashing. They made their way through the mansion until a flaming beam landed on Bruce, knocking him unconscious. Rest easy, friend. And with that, he rushed from the burning manor to a waiting helicopter. At the asylum, the guards assigned to watch the emitter were really working for Ra's al Ghul. After they took out the police, the ninja warriors set off an explosive and blew a huge hole through the wall. Gordon and his men opened fire on the ninja, who activated the emitter. Instantly, all the moisture boiled in the water pipes nearby. The pipes burst in explosions of pressurized steam. As the police dove for cover, Ra's al Ghul's henchmen escaped with the emitter. The steam settled, leaving white clouds of poison billowing in the air. Just as Gordon disappeared into the clouds, Rachel rushed in and handed him the two vials of antidote. She repeated Batman's instructions, take one of the vials for himself, and make sure the other was mass-produced, to save Gotham from the effects of the poison. Wayne Manor was burning to the ground. Ra's al Ghul had left one ninja to make sure that nobody helped Bruce. Alfred snuck up on the ninja, wielding a golf club. Just as the man turned around, Alfred whacked him on the head, knocking him out. The beam was too heavy for the butler to move himself. Alfred slapped Bruce, waking him up, and together they pushed the beam to the side. Flames rushed up the walls of the manor as Bruce played four notes on his piano. He and Alfred dove into the secret entrance, escaping to the safety of the Batcave. At Arkham Asylum, Ra's al Ghul's henchmen were loading the emitter onto a monorail train. Below, Dr. Crane, now calling himself Scarecrow, was releasing all the prisoners. Mayhem had taken over the Narrows. The dangerous prisoners had surrounded Rachel, and they were closing in. Batman burst through the ring of prisoners, and grabbed Rachel. Shooting his grappling gun straight upward, he hoisted himself and Rachel out of the insane mob, up to one of Arkham's spires. They were lifting a machine up onto the tracks. Of course, the monorail. The track runs directly over the water main. He's going to drive that thing straight into Wayne Tower and blow up the main hub, creating enough toxin to blanket the entire city. Batman had to stop that train. Ra's al Ghul entered the conductor's car on the train and started it up. Three ninja henchmen guarded him and the emitter. As the monorail lurched into motion, Gordon, who was standing below, stood in awe as manhole covers blew off and released huge geysers of poison-filled steam. Activating his wings, Batman glided down to the monorail, avoiding the huge jets of steam that erupted as the train passed water mains. Narrowly missing a tunnel opening, he rolled to a safe landing on the train's roof. Ra's al Ghul's henchmen fired at Batman, jarring him from the roof. He plummeted from the train but managed to latch his grappling hook onto it. Hanging 15 feet below, Batman was dragged along as the monorail jetted toward Wayne Tower. A truck filled with Ra's al Ghul's henchmen followed below and fired grenades. Straining, 
Batman swung out of firing range and managed to drag himself up to the train's rear car. After jumping into the car, Batman downed a ninja by firing his grappling gun at his feet. Then he smashed his way through the monorail until he was finally face to face with Ra's al Ghul. Just as Wayne Tower appeared through the windshield. You. Ra's al Ghul drew his sword and leapt at Batman, who dodged the blow. The two fought mercilessly, until Ra's al Ghul knocked Batman down. The villain swung the final stroke, but was astonished when Batman caught the sword between his steel gauntlets. The sword snapped in two. Ra's al Ghul stumbled backward, and Batman threw his grappling gun into the guiding wheel of the monorail, bumping it off its track. What are you doing? What's necessary? Ra's al Ghul dove onto Batman and began to choke him, as the train plummeted off its tracks. Are you afraid? Yes, but not of you. Batman activated his wings, broke free of Ra's al Ghul's hold, and leapt from the train. Batman glided to safety as the monorail, the emitter, and Ra's al Ghul and his fiendish plot to destroy Gotham City all plummeted into the street below, and smashed into a cloud of dust and debris. After the city had calmed down, Bruce took a moment to inspect the smoking ruin that had been Wayne Manor. Rachel found him placing boards over the entrance to the old well. Do you remember the day I fell? Of course. As I lay down there, I sensed that things would never be the same. What did you find down there? Childhood's end. Now I see that justice is about more than my own pain and anger. Your father would be proud of you, just as I am. Rachel looked up at the burned house. What are you going to do now? I'm going to rebuild it, just the way it was. The shadow of a bat was cast onto the clouds, ringed by a circle of light. Batman stood on the roof of the police station with Gordon. Nice. What can I do for you, Sergeant? It's Lieutenant now. You've started something. Hope on the streets. But we still haven't picked up Crane or half the inmates of Arkham that he freed. Gordon pulled out a clear evidence bag. Take this guy. Got a taste for the theatrics. Like you. Leaves the calling card. A joker. I'll look into it. Batman then stepped toward the edge of the roof, ready to leave. I never thanked you. And you'll never have to. Batman leapt off the rooftop and disappeared into the darkness.